Welcome to GRCC's Tutor Training. In this presentation, we will be covering some of the major areas of effective communication. I bet I already know what you're thinking. Isn't communication pretty basic? A no-brainer? Something that just comes naturally? Well, to answer that question, take a look at the politicians who spend about 70% of their time engaged in some form of communication, and they still cannot agree or compromise. All kidding aside, talking is easy. Communication is another matter. So let's take a look at what it takes to become an effective and successful communicator. Just what is communication, and how would you define it? Communication is an exchange or communion with another person or group. This sounds simple enough, doesn't it? But an exchange that is a communion requires we listen and speak skillfully. So how do we accomplish this? What are the components of effective communication? What are the skills or techniques that we need to be more effective tutors? Let's take a look. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to identify strategies for effectively communicating with your two T's. You should also be able to apply active listening and questioning skills as well as techniques to verify understanding. Finally, you should be able to analyze nonverbal behaviors. Effective communication in the tutorial setting has five major components. Proper mindset, questioning skills, listening skills, nonverbal behaviors, and vocal elements. We will now look at each of these in turn. As a tutor, you will be expected to use proper etiquette. Introducing yourself, learning your student's name, and being punctual are all a part of good manners. Even in the fast-paced world of college academics, good manners have definitely not gone out of style. When you introduce yourself in a friendly manner, you communicate a welcoming atmosphere to the student. Effective tutoring can only take place in an atmosphere of mutual respect and trust, never in an environment where the student feels he is being judged or talked down to. Can any significant learning take place in this type of atmosphere? No, it can't. People will shut down. Furthermore, please curb any inclination to impress your 2T. Students aren't interested in your prowess. They're interested only in their lack of it. You are there to help, so be careful not to confuse the 2T. This means not using shortcuts to problem solving before the 2T has built a solid foundation of the concepts. Instead, consider encouraging good study habits. Learning does not take place in a vacuum, and not every student has an innate understanding of how to study for tests. This is something you can help them with. By focusing on things such as note-taking and time management, you can help the student become more successful. As tutors, we often focus solely on the content. In reality, the learning environment is often more important. A positive attitude fosters a positive learning environment. You might ask, how does it foster a positive learning environment? Well, one of the most important consequences of a positive attitude is that it encourages persistence. And how is anything of value and importance achieved? Persistence. The ability to keep going. Sometimes it's not easy, so along the way we need positive reinforcements. Some of us need more than others. We all need acceptance of where we are, so we feel safe enough to persevere. This means being sensitive and understanding to all students, regardless of their level of need. Be patient and reassuring. Don't expect too much too soon. I know sometimes this is not easy, so if you're getting frustrated, take a break or ask another tutor or your lab coordinator for help. Praise your learner's successes in your own way. Positive reinforcements help the 2T have a sense of accomplishment. It provides a reward which builds confidence and gives them incentive to do more. After all, you noticed. Success is achieved through self-confidence and self-confidence is built bit by bit by positive reinforcements not only from others, but ultimately from ourselves. Common sense and our own experience tells us that high levels of stress are not conducive to learning. So, one of your responsibilities as a tutor is certainly not to add any stress to the session, but instead to do your level best to try and lower it. How? By having a positive attitude and being friendly, accepting, and approachable. Try smiling. Sometimes, you can use humor to release stress and tension, but humor should never be offensive or aimed at making fun of anyone. Humor can be easily misinterpreted, so if you use it, use it cautiously. 
Another way that we can foster a relaxed learning environment is not to be afraid to admit that you don't know something. No one person can know everything. If you don't know, ask another tutor, make use of lab reference materials, refer the student to their instructor, or all of the above. This lets the student know it is all right not to know something and how to make use of other resources to solve a problem. In fact, it teaches them some of those good study strategies we talked about before. Mistakes are an important part of learning. Does that sound strange? I hope not. Some of the world's greatest minds struggled with concepts and made mistakes that forced them to rethink the underlying principles which sometimes led them to a new paradigm. As Thomas Edison once said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. When students have to correct their mistakes, it forces them to reason out the underlying concepts and, as an added benefit, they are far more likely to remember the material. Our next component of communication is questioning skills. Asking open-ended questions forces your 2T to think, which is exactly what you want. Okay, what are open-ended questions? Open-ended questions usually begin with words like how, why, what, as opposed to closed-ended questions which usually can be answered with only a yes or a no response. For example, do you understand XYZ versus would you explain to me what you understand about XYZ or what are the steps involved in working this problem? Asking key questions has a twofold purpose. First, it helps you gently guide your 2T towards what to focus on, what is important. And second, it is simply more efficient. With a busy lab, it enables you to use your time wisely and to determine quickly what the student knows and doesn't know. Try to phrase your questions as clearly and specifically as possible, always keeping in mind the objective, which is their understanding of a specific concept. You might try rephrasing your question or breaking it into smaller parts or repeating it in a slightly different manner. Try to ask your questions logically and sequentially. This type of linear questioning cuts down on the confusion and frustration for your student. Asking questions at various levels enables you to determine fairly efficiently just what the student's current level of understanding is. Of course, you should adapt your questions to the level of the student's abilities. Again, this is another way of cutting down on the stress and tension during the tutorial session. Give students time to think after they are questioned. You should wait up to 12 seconds before intervening. What does 12 seconds of silence feel like? It feels longer than you might think. Our natural tendency is to jump in before we have given them time to reason out the answer. Work on holding back. You can practice this next time you are talking to a friend. Ask a fairly difficult open-ended question, then wait 12 seconds before jumping into the conversation again. It will feel like an eternity of unnatural quiet. But, on the positive side, you are giving the student time to think and process their thoughts. As you work with students, you will become familiar with which topics they have mastered and which ones they are struggling with. To help students build on prior knowledge, consider asking questions which tie the new topic to a concept with which they are already proficient. This may help the student see the big picture. Ask the student to explain it to you in their own words. This technique has many benefits, not the least of which enables you to determine if they have only memorized the material or if they really understand the underlying concepts. It is also an effective way for you to determine where their thinking has gone off track and provides you with an excellent opportunity for clearing up thinking that had previously been a stumbling block for them. Asking questions which call for the student to interpret, analyze, and evaluate forces your 2T to put the pieces together themselves. And in this way, the student will become more of a critical thinker and a problem solver, skills that are necessary for academic success. But questioning is not everything. Listening can be just as important as the questions you ask. This means not only paying attention to what a student says, but also to how they say it. Let's take a closer look at effective listening skills. Listening is an acquired skill. Does that sound accurate? I mean, isn't listening something that just comes naturally? Well, no, not when you're purposefully listening. Listening is more than just hearing. It is active. What do I mean when I say active? It means that you're tuned in. Active listening requires a listener to interact with the speaker. To confirm understanding, they will restate what they hear in their own words. Reflect what you've heard using I statements. For example, I am hearing you say, or 
I understand your frustration. Use I statements to reflect factual content the student has conveyed to you. This technique also cuts down considerably on the miscommunication between you and your student. Listen with the basic learning styles in mind. Visual learners learn by seeing or writing. Auditory learners learn by hearing, and kinesthetic learners learn by doing. There will be a separate presentation on different learning styles. For now, think about using drawings and diagrams to help explain concepts, or have your own student use them to explain it to you. Listen without judgment. I don't mean not using your judgment about how to best explain the material. We have a very natural tendency as humans to judge, to evaluate, to approve or disapprove. Your job is to evaluate answers, not people. Don't extend this evaluation to your 2T. As a tutor, you are naturally good in your discipline. This sometimes makes it hard to understand how someone else may have trouble. Just because they are having trouble understanding the topic does not mean they cannot become experts. They are just at a different point in the journey. Listen with an open mind. This is not an easy task. Bear in mind what we hear and what is actually said can be amazingly different. Why? Because everything we hear is filtered through our own value system. So you need to be aware of your own biases which might distort what you hear or experience. For example, in some cultures, questioning of the teacher is frowned upon. This means that even if they do not fully understand a topic, the student may not question you further. The same might be true of someone who does not speak your native language fluently. Being open-minded means taking a little bit of time to really experience the other person's point of view. Listening involves empathy. Try to recall a class or a concept that was difficult or frustrating for you. Dr. Covey, author of Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, says that next to physical survival, the greatest need of a human being is psychological survival. The need to be understood, to be affirmed, to be validated, and to be accepted. When you listen carefully to another person, you give that person psychological air. Once this vital need is met, you can focus on problem solving. Effective, active listening can convey respect and acceptance. You communicate numerous messages by the way you talk, walk, sit, or stand. What's that saying? Sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. One study by Moravian found that 93% of a message is sent either through nonverbal behaviors or through paralinguistics versus only 7% through what is said. The exact numerical breakdown is not the important point. You should take away from this graphic the knowledge of the importance of the nonverbal component to effective communication. There are several types of nonverbal communication which we will be looking at. The first of these is eye contact. Direct eye contact signals interest in your 2T and conveys concern, warmth, and credibility. Keep in mind, though, some cultures believe eye contact to be inappropriate. Facial expressions can have a positive or negative connotation. If you smile frequently, you may be perceived as more likable, friendly, warm, and approachable. Smiling is often contagious, and students will react favorably and learn more. However, be aware that people sometimes smile at inappropriate times for example, when we are nervous. Also, smiling can be used as a form of condescension. Be tuned in to the meaning of the smile. Be aware of any inner dialogue that may be creating a facial expression of judgment or disapproval. Nonverbal behaviors also include gestures. If you fail to gesture while speaking, you may be perceived as boring, stiff, and unanimated. This does not mean that you have to gesticulate wildly. Just show a little enthusiasm for the subject. Head nods communicate positive reinforcement to the 2T and indicate that you are listening. Posture and body orientation can also indicate interest. Leaning slightly forward communicates that you are approachable, receptive, and friendly. Speaking with your back turned or looking at the floor or ceiling communicates disinterest. The student may believe you really don't want to be there. How do you think they will react to you constantly leaning back and folding your arms across your chest during a session? Cultural norms dictate a comfortable distance for interaction with people. Look for signals of discomfort caused by invading students' personal space, such as rocking, leg swinging, tapping fingers, or gaze aversion. Nonverbal behaviors can impede or enhance student learning during a tutorial session. If a student is uncomfortable with the situation, they will mentally shut down and the session will become unproductive. 
If you tailor your nonverbal behaviors for the comfort of the student you are working with, you will provide positive reinforcement and the student will be more actively engaged in the learning process. Paralinguistics include such vocal elements as tone, pitch, rhythm and timbre, loudness and inflection. Learn to vary these six elements of your voice. If you do not vary your tone, rhythm or inflection, you will have what is commonly known as a monotone delivery. You will put people to sleep. You can also use these vocal aspects to stress important points. Stressing different words in a sentence can convey different meanings. For example, if I say, I never said she stole my money, does that have a different meaning than if I say, I never said she stole my money? If you think about your tone and which words you emphasize while speaking, are you adding meaning to the conversation? Could the meaning be misunderstood? Communication is the most important part of a tutor's job. How well you communicate will have a tremendous impact on the success or failure of a tutorial session. Think about the points we talked about today. Proper mindset, questioning, listening, nonverbal behaviors, and vocal elements. How can you use these to improve your effectiveness as a tutor? Remember, communication is more than words. For a list of references, please consult with your supervisor.